very good evening to you. Welcome to a special Hot Button Issue broadcast right here on Choice Television with me, Timothy Polio. Just doing some overtime because things are really heating up in St. Lucia. And uh, we are talking about uh, political events on the island. And in the run-up to the next general election, constitutionally due in March of 2017, but you can expect it any time at all, um, as far as the Prime Minister is concerned, he has the final say, and the Constitution is concerned as well. You can expect for us to have more hot-button issue programs right here on the Choice Television. My guest this evening, as some of you have been anticipating and some of you have been looking forward to this broadcast, some of course more than others, is the political leader of the main opposition, United Workers Party, Mr. Alan Shastney. Welcome to the program, sir. Great to be here, Tim. Thank you very much for having me. We have the unfolding of events over the last few days in St. Lucia involving the St. Lucia Civil Service Association, and you have this petition which is calling for her resignation. It was discussed yesterday and it proved successful as far as the petitioners are concerned. Do you think you bear any responsibility for what is taking place within the camp of the CSA, the tumult that's taking place right now? I hope not. Um, I mean, I don't know how. Um, at the end of the day, there are two very separate entities. Um, the, what links us is a, an individual and some other individuals because clearly, let's not forget that in our own constitution, right? The freedom of association is one of the rights that's guaranteed to us. So, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody is free on an individual basis to make whatever decision they want to make. Uh, the decision that Mary made to uh, accept our, uh, our offer to become a senator, um, that is a decision that her and her membership have to go over and make a decision in terms of whether they think it's a conflict or not. That's entirely the decision of the CSA members. But Has she did not consult the members on this issue. Um, I, I don't know if I want to say that. I was not involved. That not, was, a, was not a prerequisite. Um, uh, so that is an internal matter of the CSA. Um, uh, I know that there's a very strong association with a long history. Um, Mary did not make it to the top by not having support and not understanding and knowing her own members. And she strikes me as a person that is very humble and to the ground and, and would, would do the right thing. So I don't want to say that. I don't know one way or the other, but I have to assume that she did whatever she thought was required of her to do. But do you agree that perception is everything? And people have, were already questioning her in terms of her sincerity and in how she would be going about uh, the whole negotiation process with the GNT. Um, people are casting aspersion and to have given her the opportunity to serve as an opposition senator, and she grabbed it. Do you think that's act, act, uh, basically adding fuel to the fire? Uh, first of all, I want to um, disagree with your statement because I think it's a statement that we allow too often to go by uncommented on. This idea that perception is reality. Perception is reality if you don't uh, uh, allow other people to communicate, you don't allow the truth to come out. So if you, in fact, allow a particular message to be repeated um, and you don't contest it and you're not able to uh, bring the truth to the light, per se, um, then it can be. And so I'd rather say that perception can be reality, but it doesn't have to be. So um, I, I think that there's still time for everybody to understand what the process is. We've seen something take place last night. I think myself, among other people, don't really understand what took place. Um, but I wait for the CSA itself to be able to come to the population and explain what's taken place. So uh, I met Mary today when she was in the Senate and she didn't seem overly perturbed by the situation. Um, I've met executive members in passing. I've met members of the CSA who don't necessarily agree with some of the things that have transpired. So look, let the, the dust settle and we'll see where things go and we'll move on. But at the end of the day, that's an internal matter for the CSA. Um, and it's not something that I think that I ought to be commenting on. And I would hope that everybody would certainly not jump on the bandwagon and allow the truth to come to light. Do I think it's fair to comment the fact that your party offered her to serve in the Senate in the first place? Shouldn't she resign right now because she's serving clearly as a distraction? Well, unfortunately, um, the precedent in other countries and even in Seleucia, where they have been members um, of the uh, of unions who have been in the Senate. so. Look, that's yeah. nothing that's untoward. So at the end of the day, again, it is about the constitution of the CSA. Certainly the constitution of St. Lucia does not preclude her. And the, and the constitution of St. Lucia also prevents 
institutions from discriminating against people from being members of a political party. So right now, um, clearly, if in fact it was a conflict in her constitution, I think that that would have already been enforced or invoked. So again, I, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not connect dots that are not there. Trying to connect the dot between United Workers Party and her and then to the CSA is a very unfortunate thing to do. But I would like to think that United Workers Party has turned the page. Um, and that while we have had relationships with unions before, um, this is one of the first times that we're having uh, the CSA um, and such a large union being involved uh, directly with the party. And I think it's a reflection of the change in times, the recognition of our party, that we need to broaden our base. Um, the base of our party really was on, um, uh, really from the foundation of the farmers. And now it's to maintain that. I think that we've served farmers well. We want to continue to serve farmers well but now to broaden it to the workers of St. Lucia. So, if you get the opportunity, you'll be asking other trade unions to serve in the Senate and other trade union leaders to serve in the Senate, if you get the opportunity? Yeah, you know, I have to say to you, you know, Tim, when I listened to Mary's um, uh, contribution in the Senate today, um, it was really a welcome change. To, to hear somebody stand up and actually deal with some details, to go through a bill and to uh, stand up for the rights of the workers. I mean, some of the things that she brought up that were passed in the bill today, it was unfortunate the government didn't listen. Um, so if you now create a uh, statutory body, a private entity, and you are now going to transfer career civil servants over to that entity, uh, how, how do their um, uh, pensions and gratuities be guaranteed? But how many people will pay attention will stop and say, let us give credence to what she is saying? as opposed to individuals will be sidetracked and distracted by the fact that she is an operative of the United Workers Party. Clearly she is. Well, look, I think that the people that are shouting that the most are the people that are probably uh, more offended um, are uh, the political party that had the support of the CSA. And, you know, when all of a sudden that it was very well known that the CSA amongst a lot of the other uh, unions in government were very supportive or leaned towards the Labour Party. Um, they had no issue with that. Don't you think that was perception? Most perception than reality. Well, you because know. Because they were not serving in the Senate of a Senate uh, Labour Party administration. Well, the Mac did. He was not serving in the Senate. He served in the Senate. But not, not uh, at the same time simultaneously serving, operating in the Civil Service Association. I think you need to check your facts was, on that. Yeah, and, 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 and remember, he also. Um, he ran, ran, ran as a candidate, as a potential not, candidate. He was not the president. He was the, he the, was the secretary the general, but he was a member of the, of the association and also that he had the support of the executive. So look, one can make all kinds of assertions. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the decision of the, um, of, 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 of the CSA. But I think that what's interesting is that the shift that's taking place, you know, where you have um, uh, strong members, the Francis brothers, um, Jean-Pierre, you now have um, um, a Mary Isaac at the CSA, all moving away from, from labor. And so I, I'm hoping that the media will start going to ask the question, what's going on in labor? Why, 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 that, why are there core support be, Do you consider Mr. Shastin to be earth shattering? I mean, Mr. Peter, Peterson Francis is my friend, Mr. Herman Gil Francis mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But do you consider them uh, changing allegiance mm -hmm. from the United Workers, from the St. Richard Labor Party, to the United Workers Party, earth shattering? I think it's a significant shift, okay? And I think that it's one that has gone a bit unnoticed and a bit uncommented on, but it's something that we're seeing now more frequent. Because they're not seen as major players of the Senate Labour Party. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I beg to differ. Mm -hmm. um, they, they've certainly been there for the longest. Um, they've been there for a very long time. Um, but at the end of the day, the CSA has been supporting the the, uh, the uh, SLPs for a long time as well. So all I'm saying to you, I think that you're going to have to give some credence to the fact maybe the change is that the United Workers Party is now, in fact, uh, its image is, is changing. Um, people are starting to see it in a more credible light. Uh, people are starting to maybe see it as being the vehicle for change in St. Lucia. And we're now uh, seeing more of those people coming on board to our party. So rather than uh, get involved in uh, whether it's the right thing or not thing, there's a shift. And I think that we need to recognize it. I think when you look um, what happened with the gas prices, what you're going to be seeing with in the upcoming months and some of the other issues, um, I think it's very, very clear the United Workers Party has become a major player again in politics in St. Lucia. And I think that we're attracting 
a variety of different people that we've not had before. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, I think the perception, the perspectives that they bring to the table is a good thing. Um, and it's only going to augur well for the party. Is the United States Party taking credit for the decision of Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony to review the gas prices just on Monday of this week? Um, I think that we can say that we helped contribute, but I think that the bulk of the credit really goes to the, the, the people of St. Lucia, um, the people that came out on the march, the people that were making the phone calls, the, the people that were writing the articles, the people that were on the street corners conveying the message and bringing the truth to light in terms of what was happening. And I, and I, I think it's the power of that voice um, that caused the change to take place. And, and clearly, um, Dr. Anthony is a very smart politician. We have to give him credit for that. Um, making the announcement before the march to say that he'd already been contemplating um, the possibility, the possibility of making a change, I think was to play a wait and see as to the results of the march. I think that the march wasn't as, as well attended, wasn't as effective. Uh, maybe we would not have seen one as significant a change or as immediate of a change. So I, I believe the march played a significant role in that. And I would like to think that it was the United Workers' Party that brought this issue to light um, and committed its energies um, uh, and support to this cause. One of the major fallout from the march would have been the placard. Mm -hmm. And we know what was on it, mm -hmm. and uh, some people took offense to it, and mm -hmm. the, the whole issue was politicized. Mm -hmm. Do you regret not having come out earlier to really diffuse the whole incident? Um, no, um, because I, I think it was really important that the person who wrote the placard be given the opportunity to, to do the right thing. But and you were the organizer. Was, sorry? You were the organizer. No, I was one of the organizers. The main organizer. Well, one of the organizers. But the main and, one. And at the end of the day, it was a march that was open to the public, and people were free to come. And you know, um, what, I, what I'd really like to see happen, though, Tim, is the level of energy that the Labour Party and its supporters played on the placard and the hypocrisy that goes with it, because they're now playing it in ads all over the place. So I don't know how offensive they really think it's to people. But put that aside. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of more messages that were delivered that day that play a more significant and, and have a more significant impact on the livelihoods of St. Lucians. And the offensive policies of this government that have uh, caused some people to commit suicide um, that has what, what the, the people have lost what you, hope. What, what is the evidence of this? That because a lot of people say that, but mm -hmm. we don't have the evidence to say that it is as a result of, let's say, low economic activity or high unemployment that any one individual mm -hmm. over the last few months mm -hmm. have committed suicide in mm -hmm. St. Lucia. Well, the fact is, is that there's been a correlation between the demise of our economy, the shrinking of our economy, the loss of jobs, um, the reducing of, of, of income. Um, and the increase in suicides. And it, it, it's tended to be along, among male use. Um, so when you walk around this country- It and could be for num it could be for social problems, um, the fact that you, you're tilted. Well, I think the fact is, is that whatever it is, um, social programs have been cut. And so the ability to alleviate some of those things and to anticipate some of those things has been lost. I mean, when you go around this country, Tim, and you meet people who are elderly people, who are probably never gonna have a job again, you meet with people who are disabled and are not going to have a job again. Um, you meet with middle-aged people who um, have lost their job and all of a sudden find themselves that they don't have enough qualifications and, and every time they go for a job, there's 10 other people trying to apply. Um, and when you look at the amount of money that they're having to live, upon, uh, live on and the fact that the, the cost has increased so, so significantly in this country, and that when the government cut subsidies on rice, flour, and sugar, when the government cuts the subsidy for transportation, when the government cuts for, for, young, for young children going to school, when the government cuts the, the feeding program at the schools. And so what does those things do when the government increases the price of water, um, when the government had excessively uh, high prices on gas? And right now, I think all solutions are questioning the price of electricity and where it's at, considering what's taking place in the world, world, world market with oil. When you look at the combination of all those things, right? there's no programs that were put in place to help people. Nice by itself is not going to help it. 
right? What about a social program, a food, a, a food stamp program that's going to be targeted to those people who are the most vulnerable in our society? Why didn't the United West Party Administration implement such an initiative when it was in office between 2006 and 2011, when those same circumstances were definitely impacting the people of St. Lucia? Well, Unemployment, the, crime was an yeah, issue. Yeah. People still had a, a major concern with a lot of our economic concerns in St. Lucia. FDI, foreign direct investment, was an, an area of major concern mm -hmm. for us at the time between 2006 and 2011. I think these are all great questions, you know, and what's fantastic about it is when you look at the actual policies of the United Workers' Party, um, they, they, they show a very caring government. So we did not take away the subsidies on rice, flour, and sugar. We did not increase the price of water. We did not implement VAT. Um, and when you talk about and what was the impact of all those things, because we recognized that given where the world economy is, where things in St. Lucia were at, that if we did that, it would be catastrophic. Um, and that exactly what you're seeing taking place right now is exactly what it would have caused. We felt the most important thing to do was to keep consumption going. So it was better for government to cut back on its own programs, to, to cut back on its own capital investment programs in order to allow that money to remain in the hands of individuals. In terms of foreign direct investment, look what happened. The world financial, financial markets collapsed. It was the worst financial global calamity in our lifetime. It was only compared to the depression in the 30s. So literally banks went out of business. For a period of almost four years, there was nobody lending money. So even when you looked at the, 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 more, the bigger projects here, the Ritz-Carlton project, the Ritz-Carlton in, in Black Bay, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, what do you call it, the, the project in, in Denry, um, Pralet, all these projects, the money evaporated. The banks went out of business. And so the developers now had to turn around and find new financing. And there was no financing available. Are we available. still experiencing the tail end of, that's a problem referring to, the financial and economic crisis? Because sometimes you criticize the Stenwish Labour Party administration and say that they are just not doing sufficient as far as new investment is concerned. But can they just also make reference to the tail end effects of the economic and financial crises? Um, Unfortunately not, because we're seeing investment, foreign direct investment taking place in the Caribbean. There's a $3 billion investment taking place in the Bahamas alone. You've seen um, the new hotel in Grenada. You've seen a couple of new hotels going up now in Barbados. You're seeing new investment going into Antigua, new investment going into St. Kitts. You're seeing new investment going back into the United States of America. So investment is flowing again. It is the countries that put themselves in the position to attract that investment. And what's that? What are the things? The thing that's changed is the level of return that investors want has increased. Why? Because the banks have not returned to lending 95% of the money anymore. So any developer coming in is going to have to bring a significant amount of his or her own money to play. And we must take that into consideration. And you have a government here that clearly doesn't seem to understand what goes into investment and what an investor is looking for. Because they have not addressed the cost of operations in this country. Every single day, all they're intent on doing is increasing those costs. I mean, look at most recently the increase in excise tax. Did you know about it? Did you? Not even the bus drivers knew about it. And you put it on liquor and a whole bunch of things which is going to have an impact on the operating cost. The cost of electricity. The rest of the world has seen significant declines in the cost of energy. We're not. Give me some specifics this evening as far as how a United Workers Party administration mm -hmm. will manage the economic affairs of the Lucia. Because from where you're sitting, it's easy for you to say that the St. Lucia Labour Party administration is not operating at its optimum. It's not doing what it's supposed to do mm -hmm. in terms of breathing new life into the St. Lucia economy. But in terms of tangibles, mm -hmm. What is the United Workers Party proposing? Well, it's, it's a cross-section of things because it's not one thing by itself that's going to resolve the problem in St. Lucia. You know, you had a guest on last night, um, Mr. Jeff Stewart, and I'm very happy that he's now lent his voice to the things that we've been saving. So let's, let's focus specifically what he was talking about last night on taxation. The level of taxation that the government is imposing on the country is stifling the economy. What do we mean by that? It means that monies that ought to be in circulation um, to help consumption isn't there. The government is taking that out in the level of taxation. And when you look at the uh, economic review and, and you look exactly what just happened in the last couple of years and the increase 
an income that's taken place. Um, if you go here, uh, tax revenue was up 7.8% last year. 7.8% increase in taxes. If not okay. taxes. Sorry? If not taxes. Yes. What, should, what mechanism, what method should we use to ensure that it, we're it, able it, to manage our affairs it, finance, in it, terms of financing? Just econ. because you lower your taxes does not necessarily mean that you're not going to earn more taxes. You see, most of the taxes that we have in now are what we refer to as a turnover tax. A turnover tax is government earns the money on consumption. So the more people buy, the more taxes government collects. So for instance, that's exactly what a VAT tax is versus when you have a tax that's on the point of entry, okay? So it's, it's imperative that government understand that and cause things to happen to allow consumption to increase. And what is con consumption? It's confidence. When people are feeling confident about the economy and they're buying, the banks then start lending. So you see with the banks, they're, they're holding more and more of their reserves for bad debt. And so what does that mean? That means every single person that comes in for a loan, they're either asking them for more uh, uh, assets for them to hold, or in some cases, if you want me to lend you cash, you have to give me cash to hold. Because the banks are even scared of taking houses because a house may have one value today, but by tomorrow, it may have depreciated. And that's what we're really seeing taking place. So you've got to regain confidence back into your economy to get people purchasing. So government now needs to understand that in addition to overtaxing people, those taxes are making businesses uncompetitive. I mean, we tried explaining to them that when they put the VAT on and the manner in which they put VAT on, one, it went too high, and the policy that they had of having so many things um, as zero rated or exempt causes grief to the retailers and to the wholesalers. And when, it, when it, that grief is in the form of additional cost, those costs are being added back on to the profit margins of the other items, and particularly items that are not price controlled. So when everybody you know, says to me, Mr. Shasti, what can you do about the, the price of food and everything else? Adjust the VAT program. It is one of the key causes as to why the cost of food went up. But it was being suggested earlier on mm -hmm. that because of the high um, cost of petrol, that is why those um, increases have been in effect at the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And this occurred incidentally at the time that your father owned the main supermarket chain in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't uh, no longer it own does, it. Is this a, is a, was that a strategic move? That my father is 79 father years father. old and he wants to retire? I don't know. You tell me. No, you should tell me. Well, I, think I, think my father, I think my father has put in a good innings. I think that uh, he's been looking at retiring for a very long time. Well, I shouldn't say very long time. But, you know, he's been involved in that business. And also, uh, Andre Chastney, who was the CEO, he himself wanted to get out. So it had nothing to do with me. You know, I've never been involved in any way with uh, uh, CFL. I mean, other than I remember when he first bought the, the first grocery store. And I came down for a six-week period to help him get that business off the ground. From then, I've never really been involved. But my father's 79, and my father wanted, wants to do other things. How do you think that the current owners should address this particular issue with the high prices? Well, it, it's a couple of things, you know. Um, the gas prices here had an impact because it's a distribution. So it's the trucks that are going around. The, the, the price of the products, um, because now gas prices over the world have come down, the production of those things ought to be coming down as well, but there's always a lag effect to those things. That's why I'm saying to you the most significant um, cause in the increase in prices was VAT, and particularly how VAT was implemented. Um, so the government needs to review that. I mean, but I even think, before VAT was I implemented. I think if they have meetings with the retailers mm -hmm. and with the Chamber of Commerce, um, they will keep repeating the same things that they have said, the exact same things that Mr. Stewart said here, but the government doesn't listen. Even before the implementation of VAT in 2012, when the United Girls Party was in, in power, mm -hmm. The, those items were still, the, the price were increasing at the supermarkets, and we did not have fat at the time. Well, you know, you say that, but it's actually become much more expensive since the introduction of VAT. Um, you know, and one thing is, I'm not here to advertise for CFL, mm -hmm. right? But I remember uh, when uh, there was a lot of pressure coming on them on, those, on that same issue, um, and there was a study that was done that looked at uh, grocery stores around the Caribbean. And what was interesting is that the markups that CFL had were some of the, the lowest markups uh, in, the, in, in the entire region. And what was more impressive of that is CFL had 
pretty much of a monopoly, not entirely, but a significant part of the market share. So there wasn't really the need for them to have as low markups as they had. Um, and then when you look at the programs they did with the farmers and all the things that they were doing. So I think that people like to generally complain about the cost, but when you make it on a comparative basis, it may not be there. But the fact is, is that given the, the, the increase in unemployment in St. Lucia, given the fact that we're seeing government asking people to actually take a pay cut, um, and we're seeing not many uh, other companies offering pay rises, and the continuing increase in cost of other items, that, that it is playing a havoc with people. And so everything seems more costly. And that's why when, when our party came out to, to talk about the gas situation, we linked it to the bus fares because we felt that that would be a tipping point. That if you allowed the bus fares to go up, that that would really be something that would throw St. Lucia into a tailspin. That was a, a point where we believed it would be pushing people way too far because it would now start asking them to put pressure on to increase getting increasing wages. And, and right now, many of the businesses are just struggling to stay open. So it, it may be even a worse situation for us. And that's why we took up this cause. One, because we felt it would have a major negative impact on the economy. And two, just on the basic day-to-day -day living of the average person in St. Lucia who does not have a car and who has to depend on, on, on public transportation, they don't have the money. Let's move on to another hot button issue, and that is the plans by the government of St. Lucia through the, um, the Constituency Boundaries Commission to effect certain changes that will result in us moving from 17 electoral seats to 21. Mm -hmm. What's your position on that and the position of the United Workers Party? Um, the position of the United Workers Party is, is that we are not uh, debating the context, contents of the, um, of the report. Okay? It has been questioned in the House of Assembly by Mr. Guy Joseph, right? Yes. And, 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 and I want to really, um, because a lot of people didn't understand his questioning, and I'm hoping to bring some clarity to that tonight. Mr. Guy Joseph asked the question, um, did the commission get a budget to be able to execute the job that's required? And, and maybe it takes me to, I can go back a little bit here so that the, the, the viewing public can understand how this process works. Because it's a bit complicated um, and maybe not everybody truly understands what the process is. We have two key committees in this country. One is called the Electoral Commission and the other one is the Boundaries Commission. So the Boundaries Commission um, is made up of five people. Uh, right now it is the uh, Speaker of the House as the chairperson. The Prime Minister nominates, nominates two people. The Leader of the Opposition nominates two people. And it is the Governor General who appoints those people to the Commission. Um, according to the, the Constitution, that the, all the people who are on that commission need to act independently of, of anyone. So, for instance, if you look at the Constitution, um, Section 57, it lays out all the conditions in the commission. And if you look at Section 57.11, it says that in the exercise of its functions under this constitution, a commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. It also lays out... What gives an impression that there was a breach? Okay. The, the idea of reasonableness comes into play. So the, the commission was put together. Um, the Labour Party selected, nominated Leo Clark and Shirley Lewis, and our party nominated uh, Mr. Elcock and Mr. Eldridge Stevens. Mr. Elcock resigned and then was replaced by Leon Theodore. When they went to their, their meeting, um, they were told that there was no monies for, um, to do uh, a study. And each group was asked to present ideas to the commission. I felt as, as political leader when I was approached on this, that this ought to be something that's be paid for by the state. Why would you ask individual members who are not supposed to be in touch with the party to, to pay for that? Why would you ask an individual citizen? So if we asked you to be on a board, do you think it's reasonable that when you went on that board that you would be asked to take money out of your pocket to pay for a study? Is that reasonable? 
It's not an expectation. How much does it take to put, it, to put a study together? Well, you know, what's interesting in this entire process is um, what I was able to come across was a document that was prepared by the Commonwealth Secretariat. I don't know if you know who the Commonwealth Secretariat is. Um, it's based out of England, and it's an organization that it, all the members are the members of the, of the British Commonwealth. So there's a lot that we have in common with that group. And in 1998, um, the Prime Minister at the time, who was, happened to be Dr. Kenny Anthony, asked the Commonwealth Secretariat to do a study on specifically on the uh, constituency boundaries for St. Lucia. And it basically says on February 12, 1998, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable D. Kenny Anthony, wrote to the Deputy Secretary General of the Development Corporation of the Commonwealth Secretariat requesting the provision of technical assistance to St. Lucia, in quote, with a view to ensuring that the populations of constituencies in accordance with the requirements of the Constitution of St. Lucia. The assistance was sought to be done in, at the earliest to allow for sufficient discussion among all parties in order to further the government's uh, avowed interest in maintaining the integrity and transparency of the electoral process. Now, what's interesting about this document, and, and it's a fairly long document, so if you allow me just to quote some sections from it. So if we go to um, page four, and it's under structure, appointment, and composition. It says, since the speaker is elected by the majority party in the House, the chairman was and still is seen as a government person, given an effective control of the commission. This view is confirmed by the minutes of the four meetings which the commission appears to have convened since 1979. In spite of the last chairman's own assertion, to the author that he found it embarrassing to have to take sides in these meetings where every issue was agreed on essentially party political lines, the minutes show that he provided the majority for the government members whenever a decision was made. It goes on and it talks about the commission being autonomous. Section 57 of the Constitution suggests that the commission is and should regard itself as an independent and autonomous institution. Subsection 6, 7, and 8 underline the fact that the tenure of the commissioners is similar to that of other independent officers, such as judges, in that they provide specific and limited grounds for dismissal, combined with the special procedures which must be followed before any removal from office. Subsection 9 empowers the Commission to regulate its own procedures and delegate functions to other public officers, only the latter is specifically subject to the Prime Minister's consent. Finally, Section 5711, which is the one I just read to you, directs the, uh, the, uh, the, that one end, the exercise of function, the Commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any other person or authority. So it is very clear by this author who is a lawyer who deals with constitutions very similar to ours and understands the spirit. This offer has said that, and has interpreted the fact that in our constitution, it is, the spirit of it, it is that it ought to be an autonomous body. The United Lucas Party, don't you think it was in a position to deal with that particular issue? If you want to call it um, an anomaly, if you want to say, for example, it gives the government an unfair advantage, mm -hmm. shouldn't the United Lucas Party have dealt with this when it was in office all those years, including the period between 2006 and 2011? Well, what's interesting is, is that this study here mm -hmm. was done in 1998. Yeah. Remember, and the Prime Minister came in in 1997. So almost immediately upon coming in office. And the government of the United Lucas Party was not aware that this study existed? Well, you know... Between 2006 and 2011? It may have. You know, I, uh, that wasn't and something... Did, and it did nothing about it because it was... Well, the fact... It was in The fact is, is that there was no changes and there was nothing that was done. Okay? So, in fact, it was delinquent in fulfilling its constitutional requirement. But I think that one of the reasons why we've seen such difficulties in being able to get agreement on um, boundaries 
is for some of the reasons that are being highlighted in this document. Because, and, because parties are just suspicious, whether it's the Senrishi Labour Party or the United Lucas Party, whenever you're talking about effecting changes to the boundaries and increasing seats, the opposition would always be very suspicious. And you know, what's, what's interesting, um, Tim, is that this document actually speaks about that. It actually talks about, and it goes back into the history of St. Lucia and why, exactly for those same reasons. And what it has done is now highlighted in its recommendations, right, what the way it should going forward is. So for instance, it says a recommendation on structure. While improvements to the principles, rules, and procedures governing the commission are necessary, the overwhelming opinion supported by the evidence of the minutes um, uh, of the commission and the productivity or non-productivity of that body clearly shows that the main problem in context of the political reality of St. Lucia has been the politicization of the structure, appointment and composition of the commission. In particular, the adoption of deliverability polit politicized rather than a professionalized model for the constituency boundaries. Commission has perpetuated political confrontation and distracted attention from its primary function, del delimitation. It is the view of the author that the improved norms and procedures may provide temporary improvements, but the root problem of a politicized commission should be confronted. And the institution, institution radically changed. It is noteworthy that some of the most stable and effective electoral institutions on other, in other Commonwealth countries continue to arrive to be more independent, professional, and less politicized organizations, hence the recommendation below. You now, have to work with what you have. No, you, you don't. So? No, you don't. You but, don't. But no. how do you, will you effect how? the necessary changes? Because these... The United Party, how will the United Lucas Party plan to effect the changes that it believes would be fair? This, it's well laid out in this document. So for instance, it gives the example of the appointment of the, um, the commissioners, okay? It says they should be depoliticized. Let's see what other countries have done. So take Canada. But, but, Wait but a second. You have, no, you, you have no, asked me a question. Just now, but the point is, mm -hmm. Mr. Chastney, you decided to send those two individuals. Mm -hmm. You said Mr. Elcock first and Mr. Eldridge Stevens, and mm -hmm. then when Mr. Elcock decided to resign in December, mm -hmm. you replaced him um, with, um, with Leon Theodore, mm -hmm. right? So you went ahead in the process. Mm -hmm. You basically endorsed it. You know, I want to say that we went ahead with the process with the uh, intention of it being done on a fair basis. So they participated in the process, and I am not in any way questioning anybody's integrity or anybody's commitment to that. And the fact that Guy Joseph said that, he said, you know, at the end of the day, if you have the, the most efficient and uh, intelligent um, and reputable directors, but you do not give them the resources to do the job. So here's a question I want to ask you, Tim is as a solution, a citizen, okay, do you think what took place is correct? Do you think it's reasonable? What this document is saying is most other Commonwealth countries like ours who have similar constitutions have depoliticized those committees. First of all, if you take the Electoral Commission and why does the Electoral Commission work a lot better than the Boundaries Commission? Because the Governor General appoints the chairperson in her own right. Whereas, so it's very late in the day to be bringing up this argument. No, I don't. Okay, but going forward, how you plan to deal with this? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I it think... It has been taken before the, the, yes. the House of Assembly. Yes. The next stage will be to um, the Senate, yes. then to the Governor General. No, it General. doesn't go to the Senate. It does not go to the Senate, no. but it goes to the Governor General. To the Governor General. To the Governor General, right? Yes. And it basically, if the government decides because they have the majority. Correct. It's a done deal. Correct. How you plan to respond to this? Well, the first thing is I'm going to appeal on the Prime Minister, okay? Because the Prime Minister, in his comments in the House, said that the model that we were using would be an, is an example to the Caribbean. That as a constitutional lawyer, that he has advised many countries um, on constitutional law as it pertains to this particular issue, okay? Now, what I don't understand is he's a constitutional lawyer. So I would have imagined, even before receiving this document, that he would have been aware of some of the pitfalls. And the fact he must have, by, by the virtue of the fact that he requested this study to be done. Having this document in his hand, Tim, 
okay? And which is very detailed. For example, a simple way of solving one of the problems in, in Sri Lanka, which has a similar constitution. They passed a piece of law that said that when the head of state, which happens to be the governor general, is appointing people to that commission, that they ought to end, uh, make sure they're not political. Okay? Giving funds to the committee to undertake the study so that basically all parties there agree on the terms of reference. All parties agree on who is actually going to execute the study. What we have a, situ a situation that took place is that the commission had no money and each of the commissioners were asked to, to, sub to, to submit proposals. Leo Clark and Shirley Lewis submitted a very well document. Unfortunately for us, no one knows who did the document. We don't know who did it. We don't know how it was paid for. We don't know what the terms of reference were. All we know is it was submitted as their document into the House. What input your representatives had? Our, our representatives, and again, now here's the mistake you're making. They're not our representatives. We nominated them. Mm -hmm. They are the country's representatives. Okay, but what, what input did they have? They basically did not have the funds to be able to submit a study. Okay. And therefore, they were then asked to give comment on a very professional but study. Why did they attach the, the, the signature to the document? They attached it, the signature, because they participated in the process. And, and, and what's uh, Guy Joseph, the Honorable Guy Joseph, read out a letter which clearly states that they had issues, okay? that they didn't agree with the splitting of the seats. And they also talked about the fact that they did not, they felt given the financial situation that we had. But it, what if Dr. Kenny Antin does not decide to? acquiesce to your request, mm -hmm. set up a, a, a body that you deem to be impartial. Mm -hmm. Going forward, how do you plan to deal with this particular issue, contesting the next general election with 21 seats? Well, I don't think you we have no choice in the matter. Well, we, we, we do have a choice in the matter. I mean, and St. Kitts and the situation that just happened today in St. Kitts is proof that there's another choice in the matter. Okay? So you have a situation in which the opposition in St. Kitts opposed and, and took to court a situation in which that government came on the, the, the last uh, parliament day and uh, passed a bill to change the boundaries. Okay? Um, the government took them to court, the opposition took them to court and lost at the high court. The appeal took place here in St. Lucia, lost on the appeal and then now have won at the Privy Council. Now it's, it's funny because I felt in my heart and my mind that they were going to win because in this same document it makes reference to what the precedent is in other the other Commonwealth countries and that precedent is is that you do not change the boundaries on the eve of an election or close to election. That is not the case in St. No, no, with it's the not. elections due no. in March of 2017. It's not the case in St. Lucia but the case that exists in St. Lucia is that the precedents that are being established in other Commonwealth countries and what I'm saying to you, Tim, is the precedence, the precedence that's being established in those other countries is that they have depoliticized their boundaries commission. Do you feel satisfied as a citizen of St. Lucia that your rights have been represented? Can you reasonably say in your mind that you, that you, wait a second, that you feel comfortable? So for instance, one of the things that's in this document, okay, that has become the standard practice um, of other countries is that the commission does a draft report and that that draft report then is circulated to the entire country. It's published and then they go constituency by constituency. They meet with civil society, they meet with all the um, major agencies and they meet with the political parties. So the political parties is done through that process. My information is that you were forewarned from within the camp of the Inarukas party. Mm -hmm. You are told to get outside and professional assistance in terms of responding to the government mm -hmm. on this particular mm -hmm. matter. Is it true? The fact is, is that the, the commissioners that were on made that request of us. Mm -hmm. The party did not have the resources, but at the same time, I felt again, was it the role of the party to provide resources to do the work of the state? And also, I've just read to you that the commission is supposed to be independent. It is not supposed to be influenced by any individual or by any authority. And that's exactly what took place. So the entire process is tainted. And what I'm saying is, is that here's a document and our Prime Minister who 
oversaw this entire process, is, 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 is knowledgeable and is aware of what is taking place in other Commonwealth countries and what the general pra accepted practices is. And we have gone through a process that is clearly tainted. And it's not Alan Shastain's opinion, it's right here. All the things that we did are contrary to what is, what is said here. I mean, the document even goes on. You remember, in, in the House, um, the Honorable Philip Peer made the point um, that what was so difficult that people should sit in a room, get some maps, and have a census, and just draw the lines. Okay? This clearly flies in the face of that. It talks about that most, if not all, a lot of, sorry, most, of the boundary commissions in other countries have gone the way of professionalizing it. In fact, even in this document, it's suggested right, that the boundaries commission and the electoral commission ought to be assimilated as one of the options. Now, this document is available for everybody to see. It's online, um, and it's a document of St. Lucia. And so what I'm asking the question is, why would we have gone through this process? The United Workers' Party participated in all good faith. I am the new political leader of this party. And I'm questioning, is this the right process? Let us do the right thing. And that's why I'm appealing to the government tonight to reconsider what it's doing and do this thing the right way. Because if we do not do it the right way, there are going to be a lot of questions left and, and maybe the United Workers Party and maybe somebody else might challenge this process because you ought to consider challenging it because this represents you. This is about your rights. This is about your future. And do you want the boundaries to be determined by two political parties? Or do you believe the boundaries should be determined impartially? And that's what this document is saying. And this document gives very clear guidelines as to how that process ought to be taken. And, and this is not Alan Chastney. This is the words of lawyers working at the Commonwealth Secretariat. This is a study that was commissioned not by the United Workers' Party, but this is a study that was commissioned by the now Prime Minister, who was then the Prime Minister, in 1998. And some of these things are very easy to do. We'll take a break. You're watching Hot Button Issue. When we come back, your calls. My guest this evening, the political leader of the main opposition, United Workers' Party, Mr. Alan Schultz. Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. We conclude at about 15 minutes after 10 o'clock. You are watching and listening to Hot Button Issue on Choice Television with me, Timothy Polia. We'll put a telephone number on screen so that you can call right now with your questions and comments for my guest. He is the political leader of the main opposition, United Workers' Party, Mr. Anand Shastny. Of course, we conclude our broadcast as usual with the clip that peaked, and you do not want to miss that. Our first call online. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, hey, good evening, team. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Good evening. Good evening to your guests as well. Good evening, thank you. Um, Mr. Shaste, um, I have been listening to the show, and honestly, I can say that I am a bit, I don't know, surprised maybe. I, I have a few questions for you. You spoke about the constituency boundaries report, and you said that the persons who are nominated but were not represented um, um, as representatives of the UWP. But if it is that they were nominated, and the report clearly says that there was consultation with members of the parties before the report, why is it that you're saying that they were not represented, um, um, they were not represented representatives of the UWP? Go ahead, please. Is that the, um, only, that, is that the only question? Go ahead, please. Um, Was there a second you question? Also, you also stated that there have been no investments and so on. Um, I, I want to remind you that there were three hotels who were in receivership, and all of them were prevented from going that route. And these are jobs 
for that that was saved um, for the persons of this country. You also said that um, the report, the consultation um, um, with the members and so on, it, it's like the, 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 the members, Mr. Mrs. Leon Theodore and Mr. Eldridge Stevens, Mr. Guy Joseph made contributions in the House. Um, do you agree with his contribution? Because um, I, I, I am a bit taken aback because to me, that was undermining the persons of, of um, the integrity of Mr. Um, Mrs. Leon Theodore and Mr. Eldridge Stevens. Now, you also stated that you agree with all of what Jeff Stewart said last night, right? I, did, I didn't say that. You did not say that? No. So what did you say? No, no, call on. Just let's proceed because you're saying okay. that he said. Because no, I hold on, hold on, no, please, ma'am. Hold on, hold on, hold on, please. You're saying that he said that he agreed with everything that Mrs. Stewart said. He never said that. He made okay. particular reference. Well, that's hold on, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Please. He made particular reference to the fact issue. That is what he concurred with. Okay. All right. Since he agrees with fact, we're on fact. You said that um, for the prices at the supermarket to go down. That has to be adjusted. But, Mr. Shaftesbury, isn't it ironic? Isn't it? Um, I, I, I really don't know how to, because you are in a cabinet with, a IMF, with an IMF report stating that if that was not implemented and so on, these are the things that would happen. They predicted the things that we're going through now, they were predicted and they're happening now. You know, so. To, to say that VAT is, is uh, last night Mr. Stewart spoke about VAT, and he said VAT should never be there. But VAT replaced a whole set of other taxes. Okay, ma'am, thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, um, there's a lot of questions. I, I think that what's important for the, the caller to be able to understand is that nobody, and in, in, in certainly Guy Joseph, did not um, throw uh, Leon John or um, Eldridge Stevens under the bus. He, he never... Uh, made comment about their participation. In fact, he applauded them for their participation. What we're talking about and what he was bringing up was the process, and he was asking some very simple questions. Is it reasonable to believe that individual citizens ought to bring their own resources to the table to be able to conduct the work of the country? Is it reasonable that the, the study that was finally made the biggest impact on the, the the, um, the, final, the final report, that we don't know who did it, that we don't know what the terms of reference were, we don't know who paid for it, and that wouldn't it have been better if in fact the terms of reference and who did the study was actually selected by the people. Now this has nothing to do with the people. The individual people that were being guided by the chairman, and, and the chairman is the one who took them down this journey. So they only did what they were told to do. So they did a fantastic job given those circumstances. What we're asking is that given the document that I'm quoting from, which was a report written by the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, to be able, uh, that the Prime Minister had that. Now when you look at, when you look at this report, listen to, listen to some things. Whatever changes are to be, are made to the principles and rules governing the limitation or the procedures to be adopted by the Commission it, if, if it is regarded as functionality important that the structure and composition of the institution should be deliberately depoliticized and professionalized. The experience of the past 19 years has shown that despite the establishment of a fairly standard set of legal principles, rules, and expectations for the implementation of demilitation, the machinery has been largely paralyzed by its politicization. It then goes on to make a recommendation. It says that the transparency and the uh, application of the rule of law, which Dr. Anthony spoke about, the rule of law, um, to the delimitation process should be improved by the following. The commission should be required to publish with reasons its preliminary proposals for any delimitation recommendation, as well as the reasons for proposed statement to no changes are necessary. Objections to and observations of its proposals or statements to be made um, directly by qualified electors to the commission or at a public inquiry should it be provided for. 
legislation should be provided for appeals to the High Court against either recommendation or a statement by the Commission as envisaged in Section 58.8 of the of the Constitution. There's one more thing here I want to say to you. Oh, clearly, because we need to take the calls. I, I'll be very quickly. <clears throat> Philip Pierre made the statement that th this was very, very simple. Here's what the, the author has to say on that. He said, if this were done, it is further recommended that the Commission should be allocated professional staff to conduct the research and prepare the preliminary work upon which the Commission will base its decision. The point is that if delimitation is to be done professionally, it requires trained and professional staff to ensure its credibility and integrity. This is the point that we've been meeting over and over. We have a call. Good evening. Thanks for holding on. You're watching Hot Button Issue on Choice Television. Hello. Okay, well, call. Let's try another line. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Shastner. Good evening, sir. I, I've got a question to ask you about Mary Isaac. Sure. Do you think uh, there's any credibility in her being appointed as a UWP senator? Caller, we've dealt with that before, you know. My apologies, but we'll have to take another call. Good evening, Hotbird Nation. You're on the air. Hi, it's Murphy. How are you? I'm okay. Um, Quick contribution, um, caller, because we want to take as many calls so, as possible. So, sure. Mm. I only know that the leader of the United Workers Party does not want to speak to me, so I'll speak okay, to Okay, that's the press secretary of uh, the Prime yes. Minister. Go ahead. Yes. Quick contribution. You see, it is this kind of posturing and hypocrisy that causes the young people of St. Lucia to lose faith in politics. What exactly are you talking about, ma'am? Why would the United Workers Party participate in a process, be part of a commission to review the boundaries, make submissions to their party, have consultations with the executive of their party, as was stated in a letter, go through all of that, allow the report to be signed, to be submitted, to be tabled in the House of Assembly, and miraculously, the day after, the leader of the United Workers Party finds a problem with it. Where was Alan Chastney when the, the commission was meeting? If you do not believe in a process, the honorable thing to do, the honest thing to do, is to withdraw from the process. You cannot participate in a process, allow the entire process to go through, allow the signatures of your representatives to be on this document, and then you support the document in the House of Assembly, because despite all of the comments that were made by Honorable Guy Joseph, that were made by Honorable um, Gail Rigobert, none of them voted against that report, they submitted it. And after we have gone through that process in the House of Assembly, then you have an outsider, you have the political leader of the United West Party coming to state members of the public, whereas we participated, whereas we supported in the House of Assembly, we find something fundamentally wrong with that process. This is hypocrisy. Can we, can we go on okay. so I can answer the question? All right. It just shows thank you. that the members thank of the thank you very much. trust Alan Chastain. Thank you very much. Okay, can thank you so much. Press Secretary to the Prime Minister, Jidia Japier. Emmanuel, go ahead, please. Well, I keep questioning whether, and I keep on saying that to her, whether in fact she's the Press Secretary to the Prime Minister or is she the Press Secretary to the Labour Party. But that's for another show. The, the point is that the party participates in the process in Parliament. The two people, by the constitution of this country... The parliament does not recognize political no, no, parties. No, 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 no. The constitution does not recognize the constitution, political parties. The constitution, yeah, does not recognize parties. Does not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the participation of the party is in parliament. So it's when the document comes to the parliament that we can ask the questions. The opposition. The opposition. Mm -hmm. What did, what did, what did um, uh, Guy Joseph ask? Who paid for the study? Did the commission get an allocation of funds? Is the chairman satisfied that the document that was submitted by um, Leo Clark and, and, and Shirley Lewis, that he believes that that is not an infringement on the, um, the constitution and what the, the, the spirit of the constitution talks about? That he asked those questions. But your the, argument would have been strengthened had you... Um, proposed it even before the process um, got in the way, don't you think? I came in after this process had begun. Okay? And in fact, when you look at the number of meetings that they had, and remember, it was told, and you know this as a, media, as a, as a member of the media, that the information was confidential. So uh, this report talks about, and I just read it, that it ought to be made public. 
Why, why was thing shrouded in secrecy? Well, why is this it? thing? Why was this thing hurried through a process? And, it, let, and look, and let's read what something it said here. It said that since the speaker is elected by the majority party in the House, the chair, the chairman was and still is seen as a government person. So the government has the majority control of the committee. And whatever the other two people would say can be overridden. But but at the end of the day, we have a call. We have a call. Sorry about that. We have a call. This is Halbert Nishi on the air. Hi, um, Mr. Shafle. What I gather from what you're saying is that either the two people you sent were not in agreement and they just decided to sign, or is it an issue with the, the payment, the fact that they had to pay? What is it? You, you're confusing me. No problem. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't want anybody to be confused. The issue here is did the, the committee, the commission, undertake the work in the spirit in which the, 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 the Constitution calls for it to do? It calls that the people who are appointed remain independent. The document I'm reading from is a recommendation that was requested by the then Prime Minister, Dr. Anthony, that tells you what best practices are in other Commonwealth countries, and that you depoliticize the process, and that you should, in fact, give an allocation of funds, that you should put professional staff in for this thing to be done correctly, and that the political participation should be after the, the, the draft is done, that they then can give their comments. Here you have a situation in which we don't know what took place, meaning that the document that became the final document, okay, was largely in part the submission of Leo Clark and Shirley Lewis. We don't know who did it. We don't know what the terms of reference were. And all I'm asking, is it reasonable to believe that the monies should have been allocated to the committee and that the committee should have determined the terms of reference, and that the committee should have selected the person who did the study, and therefore you can consider an, a, an impartial um, a, a document. You have a call. Good evening. Halbert Nishi, you on the air? Good evening, Timothy. Good evening, Mr. Shafney. Good evening, Good evening. to you, caller. My question is, why request such a study as Mr. Shafney is reading out? Okay, and of course this was requested by the then Prime Minister, who incidentally actually, well, is our present Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. So why request such, okay, and not accede to the advice of that commission? Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, that's, that's the question I'm asking. You know, call. because he, he's also a constitutional lawyer, and I would love to hear his reason why we've departed from what the other countries are doing or what the best practices are. Good evening. How about the issue on the app? Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi, good evening to you, Kola. Good evening. Good night, Mr. Good night, sir. I'm not going to really touch it, that whole bond this commission thing because for me, six of one, half a dozen of another. Mm -hmm. Right? She says, he says, they say. My question to Mr. Shafty is, um, well, two of them. The first one is on the, the placard. Mm -hmm. I have a very strong issue with that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shafty, for me, Mr. Shafty has not taken responsibility. And when I say responsibility as a leader, he was the one who organized the match. So he has to take responsibility for everything that goes down. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I, I hear a lot of excuses. And then tonight I heard he said that there was a lot of other good, positive placards. But does Mr. Shafton know that, that this is all what I'm supposed to be in it? Good, positive placards. Okay, what's your second okay. point, Connor? Well, and and, and yeah. the second thing is... Mm -hmm. We, um, I also always hear you talk about that, but that. what I want him to explain tonight is if he gets into power, what is he going to do about the fact? Okay. Right? And he, sh he should have had, just one, one more thing, he should have already have a plan and to say that I'm going to reduce it by X amount, and when I reduce by X amount, I'm going to lose X amount of finances, and how am I going to recuperate that? Because saying that it is bad, it is bad, it is bad, doesn't help anybody. Okay, call. Allow him to answer. We want to take as many calls as possible. Go ahead. Um, you know, with the with, placard issue. Yeah, the placard mm -hmm. issue. I mean, we. I have addressed that um, several times, um, and it's an unfortunate incident. Um, I, I would uh, fall short of taking responsibility for it because it was an open march. But I am very happy to know that the person who was responsible of it took responsibility for it. Um, and did so in a significant way. And there's two things I want to say, that, that the, her message and her story should not be lost as to why she felt that she had to do it. 
And this is the point. The other placards that the gentleman was referring to were the other grievances that people had. And I would like to know if the government is going to apologize to the public of St. Lucia for the grief that they have caused them. That is, to me, a more important apology that will take place. With Fact, regards to that and our policies, mm -hmm. our party has clearly stated that there's two options that we're looking at. Either is a, a reduction, a dramatic reduction in VAT and how it's applied, or the complete removal of VAT and the introduction of a sales tax. We are presently working with uh, some financial institutions to measure the impact of both of those. But a significant part of that is exactly what we have been saying and was now endorsed by Jeffrey Stewart last night, is that if in fact you do reduce the taxes, you could potentially see an increase in the amount of revenue that government's generating. Because what we have seen in this country is that corporate income tax, as an example, in 2009 was about $115 million. Okay? Last year, it dropped to $55 million. And my understanding is that it's dropped even further that will be announced in the Social and Economic Review this year. So while that may be on the increase, other taxes like personal income taxes, um, duties, and those kinds of things are on the decline because the economy is contracting. We have a call. Good evening. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Good evening, Mr. Shaklin. Good evening good to you. Evening. You know, somebody just raised an issue about the placard, and I think Mr. Shaklin just brushed off it very quickly. Mm -hmm. But I must say, as we celebrate Black History Month, I personally take very, 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 very big offense when, when our own people are going to use such a word with the N-word. And this is Black History Month, and I'd like to let our people remember this is a month that we all need to celebrate. And for us to just take this word and just brush it over the carpet, it is not as easy as that. Dr. Anthony, as the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, would never allow any of his supporters in a parade or in a match with such a word in front of him, two feet away. So, Mr. Shastri, I'm very, very much disappointed in you tonight to sweep in this thing off and, or, or, or under the carpet just like you did a while ago. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. All right, we take another call. This is a hot button issue. We continue to take your calls. We conclude at 15 minutes after. 10 o'clock, we have just about five minutes left. Good evening. Yes, hello. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Go ahead with your contribution, please. Okay, uh, good evening to Mr. Shatney. Good evening, Timothy. sir. Good evening to you, caller. Yeah, uh, Mike, my, I'm listening carefully about uh, Mr. Shatney's um, argument. What I am um, concerned about is that the two, the two increase in the constituencies that we had was done by Sir John and the same system were, were done with no opposition, uh, people to oppose it, I mean. Uh, I want to find out, does our constitution says that the members of the commission have to be independent? That's the one thing I would like to know. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, it, it actually it does say that. And in the opinion of the author here, he goes on to substantiate that. What he says is that the fact that the commissioners, to be able to fire the commissioner off of the committee, requires a tribunal, etc., which is the same procedure that's put in place when you're dealing with judges, which is to, is to almost guarantee their independence. The Constitution, um, if you get your, your copy of your Constitution, and hopefully you have one, um, and I'll tell you, it's uh, Section 57, and it's point 11 of Section 57. It says, in the exercise of its functions under the Constitution, a commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any other person or authority. Okay, that is the spirit of our Constitution. And the, all we're asking is whether you believe it's reasonable to think that a committee put together that was not given any resources and that independent people who all the callers tonight, who the Prime Minister, who the, the press secretary from the Prime Minister, all keep referring to them on their political names. Hold that point. Quick call. Good evening. How about Nisha? You're on the air. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Shafney. Good evening, sir. Mr. Shafney, I just need after listening to Mr. Guy Joseph yesterday, mm -hmm. I would have thought that the proper thing to do as a political leader mm -hmm. was to come and at least not apologize, but to set the record straight. Because Mr. Guy Joseph made St. Lucians look very comical in the, to the rest of the world by taking something and reading it almost back to front. Now, you came here tonight 
And what you've done is to add a little more insult to in injury by saying that, yes, this document was written to try and justify how we should have those commissions. But you then say that the governor general appointed them. Are you saying you have no faith that our head of state, you know, can, can do something? When, when people are sit on a commission, they follow guidelines. The, the whole, they, they could have been UWPs alone on this commission. They still have to follow the same guidelines to come up with the proper way of dividing and getting the proper 21 or 25 or 30. It is not, no, it, nobody did not rob the solutions of any new thing. Mm. It is a lot of us there. So the proper thing to do was to correct guy's idiocy yesterday in the house. And come on, Okay, call her, call her. I don't like you the, the insults that you normally do. Please, no, no, don't, no, 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 no hold on, please. I didn't call anybody. Yeah, don't idiot. do it, don't do it, call her. Right? Okay, all right. And the other thing is I still need Mr. Shafney to apologize for this, this use of this, the N-word, which can and will go very viral, if he attempted an apology. The, 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 the apology, the thing he called an apology, was, 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 was requins, nicely called that thing, spitting in your eyes and calling it real. Thank you very much. He... All right, thanks a lot. Let's take a final call. Good evening. Hot button issue, you're there. Good evening. Hi, good evening, Chief Caller. Uh, thanks. Mr. Alan, good night and thank you to be there. Good night, thank you. I'm lucky to be to get that that uh, I mean, St. Lucians don't really understand how probably Labour is a party supporters are supporting. Don't they can they recall when Kenny and Tony call Guy Poodle? Can they recall when Kenny and Tony call um um the man for central? The Pete Bull and them sort of thing? I mean, come on. You have when you when you come from the flex, you have to whenever he turns his back, you have to tackle him. Kenny Anthony is not doing nothing good for the country. He was just killing the island. And we're dying out and whatever, in poverty and whatever. You have to that so high. Every man that comes, you have to pay about 15% on a hundred dollars. Oh, come on, man. And he has boots up on us. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What he wants us to do? A lame man on the street will not be able to sustain himself, whatever. Okay, thanks a lot, Gola. Final comments from you, Mr. Chastney. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the callers who called tonight. Um, uh, the, the second to last caller, I, I just want to say to him um, that he seems to have his facts a, a little bit unstraight. And if, if I in any way contributed to that, uh, I would uh, want to apologize. But I gave the example of the Electoral Commission and the Boundaries Commission. In the Electoral Commission, the chairperson is, is, is nominated by the Governor General. It, it gives her the latitude to select the person. In the Boundaries Commission, it does not. It, it clearly states that the person, is the, the Chairman is the Speaker of the House, which we've again now seen that this author from the Commonwealth Secretariat, who is a legal-minded uh, person from that, that institution, who has best practices in other Commonwealth countries, has said that other countries have moved away from that because the, the Speaker of the House is a political appointee. And so it cannot be expected that person is going to be independent. So for instance, in Canada, it's judges who, who do this thing now. It's people who have no political affiliation that are involved in this process. And that's how it should be done. And that once they have found their, 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 their recommendations, that those recommendations are made bare for everybody to see. And especially the constituencies that it's going to be affected, that they can give their opinion. What's wrong with that? And what I am questioning is, is that it seems to be that we've undertaken uh, a process that is not keeping with the spirit of, the demo of, 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 of our Constitution. And what I would like to question, I mean, uh, Guy Joseph questioned the Prime Minister and gave him an opportunity in the House to clarify the situation. He chose to go down a political route. The press secretary tonight, whose job ought to be to clarify the Prime Minister's position, and maybe if he forgot to say something, ought to have taken that opportunity to, to do that as well. But instead, again, it's these political attacks. Is this innuendos? I'm dealing with not my opinion, the opinion of an outside, a third person that deals with these issues. And I am appealing openly to the Prime Minister and to the Labour government to do the right thing. Do not allow us to get into a, a legal battle over this issue. Let us go back, agree to implement the recommendations that are in this document. We will support it. Allow the commission to be independent. Allow it to have professional staff. Allow it to make the right decision for all the citizens of this country. And we also want to say to the government, 
that in its policies, what the gentleman was expressing, the last caller, is a common sentiment in this country. Tim, people are past the point of hurting. People are in despair. It, it, how, when I go around and I sit down in people's homes, I sit down on street corners, I sit down on their doorsteps, and as I said, yesterday I was in Denry South in a place, one of the places we went to is a place called La Pointe. And I met three elderly ladies there. Um, one who had just had um, hip surgery, who was having to go up uh, a climb that she didn't have steps to go to, was lamenting the fact that she couldn't afford to put the steps in or put a reel in. It, that could not repair their homes. That they were pensioners, that they have no opportunity to get a job again. So their, their life is determined for them. They don't see any upside to what they presently have. And they realize that the monies that they're receiving are insufficient to cover their basic cost of living. We should be spending time dealing with that, Tim. We should be spending time jointly on how we're going to reverse the fortunes of this country. This is a great country with great people. And we're committed to having those discussions. Now, as a politician, I know that I have to go through my fair share of blows and take the political thing. But it, it, it is becoming uh, annoying, maybe, or disrespectful, or out of place, that we are focusing on the politics rather than facing the reality of what's going on in this country. I made a promise when I came in here as political leader that I was going to focus on the issues. I will not be drawn into those political things. I said I will not call people names. I will not ever insult the office of the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister. But I will disagree with his policies. And I think that the situation with the gas, you will be soon hearing our announcements on VAT and the pressure that we want to see the government change the VAT situation. We want to see issues in terms of pensioners, of people who are disabled, and how we're going to deal with those people who are falling through the cracks. And their country is letting them down. These are the things you're going to see this party focusing on. You can call me whatever you want. You can call whatever in our party whatever you want. We are not going to be derailed. We respect the officers of this country. We'll continue to respect them. But we must, we must deal with these issues at hand. Too many people are suffering. That is the priority we're going to be focusing on. This issue here is critical because we're talking about democracy. We're talking about rule of law. We're talking about transparency. And for the Prime Minister to have stood up in the House and proclaimed that what we have just gone through with the Boundaries Commission should be the model for the rest of the Caribbean is a bit disingenuous. And this report, and the fact that he has this report, and that he's a constitutional lawyer, he ought to have known better. But I'm asking him one more time, like we asked him with the gas, sir, please do the right thing. Bring this thing back in. Let us sit down at the table, discuss this, this, this document. Let us agree very quickly to its implementation and allow the process to go through in a democratic, transparent way to the benefit of all the, St. Lucia, all the citizens of St. Lucia. I thank you. Thank you so much for being my guest on this evening's Hot Button Issue. As always, thank you so much for watching this edition of Hot Button Issue right here on Choice Television. My name is Timothy Paul. You have a very good evening. It's now time for the clip. That peaked. <laughs> so what I did, our weapons. So I was looking for an equalizer. So, so when I guy come with the third gun butt to knock to knock me down, I turn, I twisted, and I give him the equalizer. You were shocked, you were amazed, you were astonished. The you didn't expect it. Here comes the equalizer. You never expected to get it. Mm -hmm. So when he came to give me the third one to smash my head, but he came to kill me. I turn and I give him the equalizer. I give it to him twice. So he told the other guy to shoot me. So when the guy put the gun to fire at me, I duck. And I use the equalizer again. So the guy shoot him. So when the guy pull the gun, I duck, so he cannot get me. I use the equalizer again. And the three gunmen start running. They run away from the shop. <laughs> Once again, as a broadcast, on behalf of all of us here at Choice Television and Choice News, my name is Timothy Pauli. Once again, saying good night.